Right, OK, as we reassemble the platform here. Um, I, I came to Ipswich about 12 years ago uh, in order to be uh, uh, released from a base to serve uh, God's churches across the wider relational mission family. It became clear that I needed to invite someone to take on leading the local work here. And I remember chatting with Mike Betts about it, and he said, um, call to your sons, he said. So I couldn't think of any. And then, uh, and then I remember Tom Scrivens. Come, come up, Tom, come and join me here. Uh, so Tom... <laughs> Tom grew up in, uh, in the church in Aylsham. I was part of the leadership there. And so I, uh, I thought... He was my number, one, my number one choice to bring and to, uh, to gather the church here and release me. And I'm very, very proud of this young man. I'm very proud of him. He's done an awesome job um, on several fronts. You know, not only has he, he taken the church here and matured it and grown it in beautiful ways, brought us into uh, some exciting adventures. This building represents that as well. But he, uh, I think it's not always easy for young guys to cope with old duffers like me crashing in and out, you know. And, and Tom, Tom copes with that incredibly well. And I could not feel more supported and in a better position than, than I find myself. So I honour this guy. I think he's going to bless us tonight. Uh, so let's just pray for him now, shall we? Let's just reach our hands out to him. Lord, just, uh, yeah, I just pray for uh, peace in Tom's heart. Lord, this is uh, it's a home game for him here in familiar territory, Lord. And uh, I just pray he will feel such a freedom. Lord, that you have gifted him, you've anointed him, you've given him uh, insights that are going to bless us and help us tonight. And so inspire, anoint him, give him joy as he, uh, as he blesses us with your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Morris. And good evening, everyone. It's great to see you. Welcome from me to Ipswich. It's so exciting that you're here. It's so exciting to think what God might do as hundreds of Holy Spirit-filled people spill out onto the streets of Ipswich and into the uh, cafes and restaurants and uh, pubs and wherever else you go. I'm so excited because uh, as you're going to see as you uh, go around Ipswich tomorrow and in the days to come, this is a great town, but it's also a town with lots and lots of needs as well and people who need to hear about Jesus. And so I want to encourage you um, that you have a role to play this week. God might have conversations for you to enter into uh, this week, because he is doing something really special here in Ipswich. I do believe that. It's not just that we're going to have some polar bears coming, and it's, it's not just that the football team's doing very well, much to the, the sadness of my Norfolk friends. Um, but God is doing something special here. He's doing something special in this church. Uh, we're seeing people coming to know Jesus He's doing special things in other churches as well. Um, on Sunday, just gone, we um, baptized two Iranians. Um, we, a few weeks before that, baptized another five Iranians. Um, and uh, it's a beautiful thing just to see people who were Muslims and um, having to flee a very oppressive regime, coming to England, coming, finding a beautiful welcome amongst people in our church, uh, taught English, fed taxied around the town and now coming to know Jesus. And we've been very cautious with these people because we just want to make sure that there's a genuine faith there. And we are so thrilled that there is. There, there are people who, right now in the Middle East, there's all this chaos and God is bringing Muslims to this country to meet Jesus. Isn't that good? Isn't that wonderful? And uh, on Sunday, I chatted to another guy, a young guy who uh, is English. And um, he said to me, I want to get baptized. And he's uh, on our Alpha course at the moment. And his story is that just a few months ago, he was playing Call of Duty online um, and chatting to some guys as they were killing the bad guys. And um, this one guy in Wales started to share, share the gospel with him. And uh, he responded to the gospel. And this guy said, you've got to find a local church that does an Alpha course. And so this guy found our church online, found that we were doing Alpha, got this guy on Alpha, and now he's given his life to Jesus. His wife is on Alpha now, so he's supporting her on this Alpha course. She's given her life to Jesus and wants to be baptized. So God is doing incredible things. And I want you to be encouraged by that um, because, uh, yeah, this week you might get to play a part in uh, some of that as well. 
Now, before we tuck into um, today's message, I've been asked to do a couple of book recommendations, and I've just realized that one of the books that I picked up, I actually haven't read. That's a bit awkward, isn't it? Um, it's a different book to what I thought it was. But um, I'll recommend it nonetheless, because this is by, um, is this me? It may not be me. Uh, this book is by Rebecca McLaughlin, who is a fantastic author. We've actually gone through one of her books, um, which is for teenagers, uh, answering some of life's big and tough questions. And uh, this is, I think, aimed at adults. It's a very similar book. So it's called Confronting Christianity. There's only a few copies of this available. But Rebecca, Rebecca McLaughlin is a fantastic communicator. And if you want to take this uh, through with a friend who maybe has got big questions, this is a great book uh, to go through with them. And similarly, another book that I've read, actually read, uh, is a book, um, is this me, Jonathan? Yeah. Is that a little better? Is that, yeah, we'll go with that. Uh, this book is called The Air We Breathe, and it's by Glenn Scrivener, um, who's my Australian cousin. Uh, he's not really, um, but he's a, he's a brilliant, uh, brilliant communicator. He's an Anglican guy based in Eastbourne. He is actually Australian. Um, and he's written this book called The Air We Breathe. And maybe you've got a friend who kind of says, I wish I could have a faith like you, but I, I could never really believe the things that you believe. Um, this is a kind of book for them because he wants to show the readers that actually there's many, many things that we in the West take for granted, um, like equality, for example, and human rights, that actually are not based on evidence. They're not based on things that are really evident, self-evident, but actually actually a, uh, a heritage of our, our Christian past in the West. And it's a fantastic book to strengthen Christians, but also to take through uh, those who maybe are sceptical and thinking about these things. And at the end of it all, it's a really wonderful appeal to, uh, to non-believers. So I want to recommend that book, having actually read it. It's really, really good. But as is Confronting Christianity by Rebecca. I don't know what's going on here, folks. Sorry about this. I might have to use a handheld. Shall I do that? Thank you, Morris. Okay, we're going to be um, diving into John chapter 12 tonight. If you have a Bible with you, we'll go there in a little while. But I was um, amazed just to hear Matt and Helen's um, testimony just now, that it was five years ago that these guys set out. And I remember praying with Matt on the last day of the Courage Conference. We had a great time just praying as these guys were about to set out. And to hear what God has done in those five years uh, is really, really, really encouraging. And it was in that week that actually we had a very big week for us as a church here in Ipswich because um, we had um, our church facing the local uh, council with a planning application to basically be able to transfer uh, this building from a place of leisure to a place of worship. And I was leading SENT, which ran alongside the Courage Conference, so I couldn't be here to kind of contend on the church's behalf. And uh, God gave us really good relationship with a local counsellor, uh, a lady who went to the meeting and uh, forfeited her vote on the council uh, to basically plead our case for us. And then she went on the local radio afterwards and, uh, and she said that this is going to be great news for the town and God gave us the planning permission that we needed to move into this building. And over these last five years, we've been on quite a journey, uh, not only renovating this building, but all of the ways in which God has uh, added to us those who are being saved. It's been really encouraging, but it's also been really tough. I wonder if you just think back to the last five years and all that has happened in the world, all that's happened in the church. It was three years ago that we were due to have the call. And as Morris alluded to at the beginning, COVID happened. And we had to learn a whole bunch of new phrases, a whole bunch of new vocabulary entered our language, social distancing, PPE, asymptomatic, things like... Uh, epidemiology, words we'd never used before. I don't know what they are in your language, but you would have learned different phrases to kind of deal with the things that we were learning. My, my favorite one and my least favorite one in equal measure was doom scrolling, where we would like at late at night just scroll through our phones and kind of hear the latest predictions of doom that were coming to us about how long we would be in this pandemic. We had to get our heads around a lot of stuff. I think that by the end of it, half of us here could probably have a good stab at an epidemiology degree. You know, we, we actually knew enough to kind of get some sort of qualification in infectious disease. It was that 
kind of we had to get our head around a lot. But it was also really tough because we were asking ourselves, when will this end? When will I be able to see my loved ones again? When will I be able to see my church family again? It was hard work leading churches in that time, wasn't it? It might seem like a long time ago. It was only about two years ago that it all kind of came to an end. It was hard work leading churches and leading teams when you couldn't see each other and you kind of had to do Zoom meetings and you couldn't really tell whether someone was actually secretly playing solitaire whilst you were trying to speak. You, you couldn't actually have one-to-one -one meetings and find out he, how each other were really doing. It was so difficult. It was frustrating having to preach to a camera and you nailed the perfect take and then you go to the camera and then you realize it wasn't even on in the first place. And then when you finally actually get it right, you upload it to YouTube and then the next day you see, hey, we've got 250 views. This is amazing. But then someone tells you, you can actually click on that view count to see what the average view time was. And it was about two and a half minutes. And you realize all this effort and people are watching for two and a half minutes. It was really, really hard work. It was heartbreaking not to see church family in that time. Some of our church family, hey, they never came back. Anyone know that to be true? It was heartbreaking. Some of us having to say goodbye to loved ones over a screen or wearing PPE. It was a hard time. And then during all of that, there was the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matters protests and having to get our heads around some really, really big things. Having to get our heads around the hurt and pain that people were feeling and the confusion as to how to process these things. And then after the pandemic came the financial crises. They were kind of inevitable, really. The amount of money we've had to spend to try and get through the pandemic. And a whole bunch of new vocabulary came in. The cost of living crisis and inflation and interest rates. And we have to start asking ourselves, are we going to be okay? Are we going to get through this? Are we going to have enough? Are our church family going to have enough? Is there going to be enough money to go around? Are we going to get by as a church with the money that we, that we have coming in? All these pressures that we start to feel. And then this year, a whole new set of vocabulary entered the minds of church leaders in the UK and elsewhere as well. Phrases like spiritual abuse and narcissistic leaders and gaslighting and hashtag church too and toxic masculinity and all of these phrases that maybe were brand new to us may have been going around for a few years but really some of the high profile problems that maybe had been overseas in the states or elsewhere came home to roost and we we had to go through a very very difficult year it's been a tough year hasn't it it's been a heartbreaking year learning of people really hurting from the way they've been treated in church. We're a people who are passionate about the church. We love the church. The church is to be a beautiful, radiant bride for Jesus. And then when we hear that people in churches have been treated in such bad ways, it's heartbreaking to hear it, isn't it? It's so deeply sad for them, the, what they've had to go through. But it's also so confusing for those of us who are in leadership. Morris and I have sometimes joked over the years when we've gone through difficult things, or at least it's better than shipwrecks and being whipped. That's kind of like how we've consoled each other at times. At least it's better than that. But we mustn't just kind of grit our teeth and just think, well, you know, we just get through. That's what we do. We've actually got to grieve some of these things and, um, and understand that it, it is really hard sometimes. And yes, there are people across the world going through awful persecution that puts some of these difficulties into the shade in a big way, but it's no less hard. It's no less difficult. Some of the things we have to carry, I'm not just talking to elders of churches here, I'm talking to a bunch of people who are carrying a lot of weight in ministry. And it's a downright confusing time. Where's the line between clear biblical shepherding and overly heavy spiritual abuse where's that line where is it what's the the line between healthy max masculinity and toxic masculinity where, where is that where is healthy strength and abuse where's the line 
We've got all these questions floating around. And, and how can we speak into these dynamics without being criticized by people on the sidelines who are, are trying to discern and complain about these things? How, how, how do we do it? I can't be the only one here who has wondered, is there any hope of kind of getting through the next 40 or 50 years of ministry without having something labeled at me? Has anyone else found that? Anyone else wondered that? People are more and more susceptible now to being drawn into culture wars. That's a whole nother thing for us to get our heads around. There's tensions erupting in different parts of the world. And now those in our, in our care are, are, are susceptible to be drawn into culture wars where there's more and more animosity, less and less forgiveness, more and more vocal kind of aggression. It's exhausting sometimes. I need to tell you something, that there have been times over these last few years when I thought it might be easier to kind of go back to social work, which is what I did before. There was a, a moment in the, the, the kind of height of the pandemic um, agony, really, where I kind of, for a couple of hours, thought, I wonder if I've still got that documentation somewhere that will allow me to go back in. I wasn't thinking about turning my back on the church or even on eldership, but I just thought it would be easier just to go and do something else with most of my time. And the Barna Group in America, maybe you've come across this statistic yourself, uh, estimates that 42% of pastors in America have considered quitting in the last three years. So if, if we're anything like that here, then there'll be a number of you here in senior leadership, whether that's in eldership or in, in a team, leading an eldership team, or in other kinds of ministry, and you thought, you know what, it'll just be easier to quit. This is too hard. I can't do this. You wouldn't be alone in that, I'm sure. It's been exhausting at times. As I say, there's much worse stuff going on across the world. We can have that perspective, but we can end up really drained, dried up, dried out, battered. We can find ourselves nostalgic for the past, Anyone find themselves thinking back to the good old days? You know, that can happen, can't it? When we, we find ourselves drained, and if we don't bring it to God, we, think, we find ourselves thinking about the good old days. And it was you too who said in their song, God Too, that we glorify the past when the future dries up. That's true, isn't it? In Psalm 42, the psalmist kind of goes through this when he says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise amongst the festive throng. The psalmist is downcast and thinking back to the good old days, the glory days that were behind him. That's what can happen when we feel like we've just been burnt out. We feel like we've been under pressure for so long. We look back and think, well, those good old days, they're behind me. The rest is, I wish I was back there. I wonder if you're in that place today. We've had a, a, already had a glorious time of worship in God's presence. But, but really, if you are honest with yourself, I wonder if you found yourself in that place of being dried up and feeling defeated, feeling like I've got nothing more to give. Whether you found yourself in that place of, I think I just want to lay it down. I want to lay the responsibilities down that I have. I want to go back to the good old days of less responsibility. I wonder if you've been in that place. I wonder what you are doing here this week. I wonder what your reason is for being here. Maybe you kind of think, well, questions would be asked if I wasn't here. Maybe you think, I, I really ought to be there as an example to those that I'm leading. So I ought to be here and I ought to look enthusiastic. I ought to go through the motions. I ought to raise my hands because what would people think if I didn't? They might think I'm in trouble. I don't know what you're doing here this week. I wonder if you've thought about that. I wonder if you could really give an answer to that. Is there a burning joy in your heart when you think of Jesus? Is there a burning joy in your heart when you consider him? Or have you got very, very busy serving the church, but actually I don't really want to spend time with Jesus? Is that where you've got to? Maybe that's where you're at tonight. Maybe you've got nostalgic for the past. Maybe you've considered that your glory days are behind you. Well, we're just simply going to come back to Jesus tonight. That's what we're going to do with the time that we have remaining. So John chapter 12 is where we're going to be. 
And John chapter 12 has a parallel in Mark chapter 14 and in Matthew chapter 26. And it's in those accounts that we see that what we're about to read takes place in the house of a guy called Simon the leper, who was probably not a leper by this point, but he's still got known as Simon the leper, poor guy. And he's probably a family member or a friend of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. He may well be their dad, or he may be a friend who just has a big house, because as we're going to see, this is a meal that is celebrating uh, what Jesus has done for Lazarus. Now, there's a, a very similar story in Luke chapter 7, which maybe you're familiar with, where a different woman actually anoints Jesus with uh, a really costly oil. And it takes place at the house of a different guy called Simon, Simon the Pharisee. But it's a very different story. It's not the same account. But as I say, Mark and Matthew's accounts we will dive into because they are the same story. So John chapter 12, let's read the first couple of verses. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. So this is a thank you meal for Jesus, who not long before had raised Lazarus from the grave. And I just want you to picture Lazarus for a moment, just reclining at the table with Jesus, and how he would have just been fixated on Jesus. How he would have just, can you imagine the days after his resurrection, after Lazarus was brought out of the grave, can you just imagine all he would have been thinking about was Jesus? All he, all he would have heard in his mind, just echoing in his mind, was those words, Lazarus, come out. And as he sat at the table with Jesus, he's just thinking, this is, this is amazing. This guy brought me from the grave. He's just fixated on Jesus. And Martha's in her place, as she often is, serving, getting everything just right. And then we read on. Then Mary took about half a litre of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it out on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Mary's got a very, very special task at this meal. And I've often thought, maybe you have too, that this was a kind of spontaneous thing. That Mary just suddenly, as they're eating, she kind of runs to the bedroom, gets this perfume and just thinks, right, now I'm just going to pour it out on Jesus. I think this might have been a planned thing. I think this was a, a planned moment to honor Jesus for what he had done for Lazarus. It would have been very rare for a woman to own something so valuable as this. Matthew and Mark's accounts say that this perfume was worth at least a year's wages. So in, in modern terms, we're talking 35,000 pounds a year. That's kind of like the average rate, wage in this country, or 40,000 euros. This is worth a lot of money. This perfume is worth an awful lot of money. It's not Lynx Africa. This is, <laughs> this is, this is really good stuff. It's taken, it was produced with ingredients taken from the Himalayas. So it had to be carried on, on camel back through mountain passes to kind of reach its destination. This was the best stuff around that she's used to pour out on Jesus' feet. And as we read in Mark and Matthew's account, she actually covers his whole body in this perfume. This wasn't just a little spray. You know, like when you go to the airport and you... When the person isn't looking, the, the shop attendant isn't looking, you don't spray the little white piece of card. You actually spray yourself quickly, just so you can smell. We all do it, right? Or is it just me? It's just me. I feel really bad now. Thanks, John. This isn't just a little spray. This is completely covering Jesus in this perfume. And then she wipes his feet with her hair. And women in those days would very rarely un unbind their hair and they really only save it for, for their, their husband. This was such a, a, an intimate thing to do, to unbind her hair and to wash, wash and wipe Jesus' feet with her hair. She could have used a towel, but her hair was the most beautiful thing she had. And she's saying, you are so worthy 
that my hair can be a towel for you, Jesus. That was a beautiful thing. And the whole house smells of this fragrance. Can you just picture the scene? It suddenly it overtakes the smell of the amazing food that's being cooked by Martha. It overtakes the smell of the sweat in the room. It would have been a sweaty, hot environment. It overtakes the smell of the, the cattle in the courtyard. And the whole place is just filled with this perfume. And this is the week of Jesus' crucifixion. He would have smelt like that for days. Every now and again would have got another waft of that beautiful thing that Mary did for him. The smell is everywhere. It's powerful stuff. But Matthew, Mark, and John report what happens next, and it's pretty ugly. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief as keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put into it. So, so in Matthew's account, he's quite happy just to say some of the disciples were a bit angry about this. Mark, um, he names, uh, he, well, no, so if Matthew says some were indignant. Mark's happy to name that it was the disciples. John says it was Judas. John's kind of not very happy with Judas. Judas is angry about this. It's overly extravagant. It's wasteful. And then Jesus rebukes Judas. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Jesus rebukes Judas. He rebukes them in the other accounts because he knows it's not just Judas who is kind of thinking about this. It's not just Judas who thinks this is a wasteful thing. He sees in the, the hearts of the disciples that they think this is wasteful, that they think this is over the top. They think it's too extravagant. Maybe some of the other disciples were shaking their heads, but Jesus says, leave her alone. This is where she is meant to be. This is the rightful place for a worshiper, abandoned in praise, lavish in devotion, un inhibited in worship and using her very best and most valuable assets to pour out her love for me. Jesus says, leave her alone. And it's kind of an awkward moment. It doesn't, John's account doesn't end in a very satisfactory way here. John just kind of gets on with the rest of the story. Well, Matthew and Mark report that it was kind of awkward. This is an awkward moment. How the disciples know this rebuke from Jesus. I'm learning Jesus was quite okay with awkwardness. I'm not okay with awkwardness often. Jesus was okay with awkwardness. And the disciples are kind of feeling this conviction. And Jesus says this. He wants this story to be told all over the world. This is what Matthew and Mark report. That Jesus wants this story to be told all all over the world, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, he wants this story to be told. Now, that's a big deal, isn't it? Because he doesn't say that about the feeding of the 5,000. He doesn't say that about the walking on water. He doesn't say, guys, make sure this is recorded so that everyone hears about it. He says, this story, what Mary has done for me, will be told all around the world, wherever the gospel is proclaimed. And so I think there's some big implications for us and for the churches we serve here. I think there's some big implications maybe for those of us here who are weary and tired and feeling like we might want to quit, or we've felt that in recent years, maybe some who are feeling duty-bound, feeling like some things have grown cold, feeling like I'm just going through the motions. I think there's some things for us here. The first is this, that we need to recall the desperate state we were in before we came to know Jesus. We've, we've got to call this to our minds. You notice that the apostles are very, very happy in their writing to bring us back to where we were. Very happy to say, as for you, you were dead in your sins. Very happy to take people back to where we were at before Christ. And the last time that Mary was at Jesus' feet like this, in chapter 11 and verse 32, she is desperately saying to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
This was as desperate as it got for Lazarus and for his sisters. It was desperate. He was totally dead. He wasn't just kind of a bit dead. He was totally dead. It had been a few days and he was starting to smell really bad. Jesus had deliberately left him to die. It says it in, the, in chapter 11, so that they would believe. He had allowed this to happen. And Lazarus was really, really dead and starting to smell really bad. And friends, we've got to recall that this was us. We were totally dead in our trespasses and sins and smelling really bad in the world around us. We were, all of us. Whether we came to know Jesus at seven years old or at 17 years old or at 50 years old, all of us were dead in our trespasses and our sins, just going wherever we wanted to go. Not caring about the boundaries that God had laid out, we trespassed all over them. We didn't love God as we should. We didn't love neighbor as we should. We just went wherever we wanted to go and we stunk because of it. And you might think, hang on a minute, a seven-year-old is kind of cute. They don't stink. Hey, you're very welcome to serve on our kids' work. You really are. I'd love you to do that. Listen, we all were in that place, dead in our trespasses and sins. No one can say here, well, I was, I was just kind of a bit of a bad boy turned good. I've turned over a new leaf. No one can say here, well, I just kind of, yeah, I learned how to do things right after a little while. A bit of a process, but I learned. No, no, we were dead, totally dead. It was total deadness, and we contributed nothing to the resurrection process. I was preaching on this in Colchester last week, and... Uh, and someone came up to me after and said, I've actually died six times and been resuscitated six times in my life. I thought, wow, you know what? That person can never have said, well, I, I did lie in a pretty good position. I, like, as I was being resuscitated, I made it very easy for those resuscitating me. No, they didn't do anything. They didn't contribute to the process at all. They didn't say, you know, I kept my mouth open at all times. I didn't shut it. No, they were dead. They couldn't do anything about the process. Totally dead. All of us followed the ways of the evil one. We were conformed to the pattern of this world. We gratified the the cravings of the flesh. We were by very nature deserving of God's wrath. This was us, as dead and as stinking as Lazarus. Paul says in Ephesians 4, we were cut off from the life of God. We've got to come back again and again to this because in the West, and many of us here are, are in kind of Western nations, we are swimming in waters that kind of say the opposite to this, that you are basically good, and if you really put your mind to it, you can achieve anything, right? We we scoff at the L'Oreal Paris kind of uh, tagline, because you're worth it. I mean, what an effective tagline, right? Everyone knows it's L'Oreal, but we kind of swim in those waters so much that eventually we start to believe it. I'm basically a good person. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm okay, and I'm worthy. You start hearing that a little bit. You start seeing Christians even posting to each other, hey, you're worthy. What does that mean? No, no, no. We, are, we were dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, totally doomed, rightly doomed, destined for wrath, totally helpless to do anything about it, in total darkness, without a chink of light. And then God came. Jesus came to our tomb and said, come out and live. And we live. This is the gospel, friends. It's not that we kind of just met him halfway. No, no. He said, come out and live. And we lived. And we've got to call to mind what it was like before Jesus. He came to roar to our hopeless dead hearts. Come out, live. And our whole life is now one like Lazarus's, fixed on Jesus Ephesians chapter 2, we know these verses so well, but I'm going to read them anyway. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. We've been resurrected, friends. But just like my friend who has been resuscitated six times. Maybe we can kind of lose sight of the wonder of it all eventually. 
Maybe we can lose sight of quite how desperate our situation was. Maybe we can cease to be amazed at it all. We've got to come back to see that he did it. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son, Jesus. We've been taken out of darkness into his glorious light. We've got to see what he's done for us, friends, and we've got to wake up again to the worth of Jesus. That's what I want to say secondly. Let us wake up again to the worth of Jesus. Jesus is worth this big feast that Martha puts on for him. He's worth the attention that Lazarus fixes on him. He's worth the very expensive perfume being poured out upon his feet and upon his body. He is worth it. He is worthy of every ounce of energy we have. He's worthy of every song that we can sing. He is worthy of it. He's worthy of all of the things that we might have struggled with in recent years, the exhaustion of it all or the confusion of it all. He's worthy of it. He's worthy of foregoing some privileges. He's worthy of foregoing a holiday to be in Ipswich on your half term. He's worthy of your money being poured out lavishly for world mission. <laughs> He's worthy of it. He's worthy of every ounce of energy we have. It's the worth of Jesus that we were drawn to at first, isn't it? It's the worth of Jesus that we were drawn to. This isn't a job. Those of us who have the privilege of working for our local church, this isn't a job. We were drawn to the worth of Jesus. And then one day someone said, hey, could you give more of your time to this, please? We were drawn to the worth of Jesus. And we've got to return to our first love, friends. We've got to return to that which first drew us in, which is the glories of Jesus. And Jesus says to a very successful church in Ephesus, right at the beginning of Revelation, this is a church that was incredible in many, many ways. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. This is Revelation chapter two. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and you've not grown weary. Well done for persevering through the weariness, through the confusion. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Just consider that. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. This is a truly great church in Ephesus. And Jesus is saying you need to repent. You need to, to stop some things and you need to turn around from some things and go in a different direction. You need to, you need to remember your first love. You can get caught up in all kinds of other things that are not the big priority. Repent. Take action. Do the things you did at first. What did it look like at first for you? What did it look like when you were first drawn in to who Jesus is? What did it look like for you? For me, it looked like playing guitar very, very badly and writing songs for Jesus. It looked like wasting a whole day to walk in the countryside with him and talk to him. It looked like singing as I pushed trolleys around a car park at 11 o'clock at night for my job. That's, that's what it looked like for me. What did it look like for you? It looked like devotion, I bet. It looked like devotion in different ways. It didn't look like being at the beck and call of everyone who wanted your attention. It didn't look like having to have an opinion on everything and the next hot topic that comes around that you have to know about. Having to have words on every situ situation that comes up. It just looked like simple devotion to Jesus. 
And these things have been squeezed out for me at times, squeezed out due to busyness, busy doing good things often, squeezed out by sin, squeezed out by the opinions of others. What will people think of me if I went and spend half a day or three days with Jesus and don't come back with a paper that I should have written? What will people think of me? That won't look very productive. It won't look like I've been very efficient. But it's devotion. Squeezed out by the opinions of others. And you know what? It's normally not even that people are even thinking those things. It's just like a, a kind of Judas voice in our mind saying, that is not very productive. That's not very impressive. You see, spending time with Jesus is often, it's often not very kind of impressive sounding. But this is what he calls us to return to. Jesus says, here, I need to repent. I need to turn around and do the things I did at first. Maybe not pushing trolleys around, but just be with Jesus. To be ready to be misunderstood because of my devotion to him. To be ready to write songs again to him. That will, I'm just going to bet now, will never be sung on the main stage at New Day. Because they would be kind of not very good. But that to Jesus, they're very, very beautiful. Do you think we've got half of David's songs in the Bible? I don't, think we've got, I don't think we've got anywhere near half of David's songs in the Bible. Some of them are not as going to be the big hitters like Psalm 23. But they were beautiful to God. Really beautiful to him. And this is what Jesus is saying we've got to return to. What she has done for me is beautiful, Jesus says. Just think about that for a moment. Just think about that for a moment. Jesus is stunned by what she's done. Jesus, who created beauty like this that we see on the screen. Jesus, who created beauty like this, is stunned by what she has done for him. She, he is absolutely bowled over by what she's done to the point where he says, this has got to go around the whole world. He is moved by Mary just pouring out her love for him. He's moved by her, able, her, just her ability to speak freely with her actions, not being held back by others. She recognized the worth of Jesus. She let down her hair. Let's wake up again to the worth of Jesus. Let's return to our first love. Thirdly, let us see that he's of far greater importance than ministry. The poor you'll always have, Jesus says. In Matthew and Mark's account, he says, and you can serve them anytime you want. There'll always be ministry. There'll always be ministry to do. There'll always be people to serve. They won't ever go away this need to minister to others. And Jesus' heart is so for the poor. He can't be misunderstood here. He's so for the poor. It's undeniable. But he's clear here that to know and to love him is the number one priority. All our love for others is to flow from our love for him. Where we receive his love as he pours out his Holy Spirit into our hearts. See, Mary only gets three mentions in the whole of the Bible, as far as I can tell. One is that she falls at Jesus' feet to beg him and plead with him that if only he was there, her brother would still be alive. Two is when she pours out the perfume on Jesus' feet. The third is when she sat at Jesus' feet while Martha is busy serving everyone. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are troubled and distracted by many things. You are being pulled away from the best thing. Mary's chosen the best portion to be at Jesus' feet every single time. Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. The expectations of others, the next big thing that we've got to get our heads around as church leaders, the next big event that we're doing. Mary has chosen a better thing and it won't be taken away from her. Listen, Jesus is more important than any ministry. I don't know where you serve, what you're doing in the life of the church or in your workplace, but listen, Jesus is more important than that. And if obeying him is put on hold because we start to worry about what might happen to the ministry that we are building, then we've got problems. We've got problems, friends. Ministry will always be there. The point of your faith is to enjoy time with Jesus. 
The point of your faith is to enjoy time with Jesus. The point of your life is to enjoy time with Jesus. This is why you exist, is to walk with him. All else flows from that. There's distractions everywhere. Technology is such a distraction, isn't it? We, we can't be alone on, on, on our own with God anymore. There was a, a, a study done about six years ago where some people were given the choice to sit in silence for four hours or to have themselves gently shocked with electric shocks over and over again. Two-thirds of men chose to be shocked with electric shocks than to sit in silence. The women, it was one quarter of all the women. We, we can't just be before God. We have to have something else going on. We're in a distracted age. It's not easy to choose Jesus. It's often the slow way. It's often the uneventful way. Sometimes I'm asked, you know, how was your prayer walk this morning? It's very, very rarely life-changing. It's very rarely that I say, you know what, I had all this amazing kind of wisdom poured into me. It's normally just I sang and I thanked God and I unburdened my heart before him. And I just walked sometimes and just looked at trees. Like it's not very exciting. But I've been with Jesus. I've got to be before him. And if I'm starved of that, I'm finding, if I'm pulled away from that, dragged away from that, I can see my leadership as a duty bound thing. I can see it as a job. I can see it as something that I must do, not a joy thing. I can feel the pressure of things more than I should. I can start to see this as something that I am building rather than something that God is graciously allowing me to play a part in. Friends, you will always have ministry. Seek Jesus first. John Tyson, who's a pastor and author, in New York City, he says, you need to say one gigantic yes that helps you say a thousand smaller no's. Say yes to, I'm going to be with Jesus. And everything else will flow from that. You'll be able to say no to a bunch of things. No, I can't do that right now because I've got to be with Jesus. No, I can't commit to that at this moment because I, I know I've got to spend time with Jesus. I've got to be before him in prayer. It helps you to say no to some other things. I can say no to that distraction because I've got to be before him. You know, it's only been in the last 100 years that the word priority has been pluralized. Just let that sink in. (laughs) When it was first used about 600 years ago, it was meant to be about one thing, the priority the one thing that we give ourselves to. And now we talk about priorities. And Jesus can become one of a number of priorities, can't he? He's the priority. He's the big yes. And fourthly, finally, we must proclaim his worth all over the world. Mark and Matthew record these extraordinary words from Jesus. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. I love how enthusiastic Jesus is. I love that he doesn't just kind of say some half-hearted things. He's saying, this is so beautiful. This has got to go everywhere. I'm an enthusiastic guy. Maybe you pick that up. My middle name literally means enthusiasm and my first name means twin. So I'm like doubly enthusiastic. So Jesus is my guy here because he's saying this has got to go everywhere. This can't just be like, oh, this was a nice thing. This was so beautiful. It's got to go everywhere. He's so thrilled by this act of worship. I wonder what Peter and John and Matthew and others did with that command. I bet they told the story everywhere. I bet they told the story everywhere they went because Jesus has said it. (laughs) I love that we've articulated our values as a family of churches. I love the values that we're building to word and spirit, the grace of God being such a glorious thing, servant leadership. I love all these values, friends. I love it. I love what we're building to. Yes, yes, yes. But I think we have to say, in response to what Jesus says here, that actually what we want to see in every church that we are planting and strengthening in whatever role we play, we want to see red hot worshippers of Jesus everywhere we go, don't we? 
responding to his great worth, responding to the fact that we were once dead in our trespasses, in our, in our sins, and now he has made us alive in Christ. This is what we want to see. We want to see, do people love Jesus or do they love playing church? Do they love being in a club? Do they love the busyness of serving that just brings them out the monotony of life? Do they love Jesus first and foremost? Do they love him or do they like being on, on the right side of a particular culture war? Do they love Jesus? Or do they just come because they think their children could do with some good moral teaching? May it be a priority for us that we so speak of the glories of Jesus that people fall on their faces in worship of him. That we call people back to their first love. That we call people to see him for who he is and pour out devotion to him. I long to see men in my church pouring out their hearts to God in worship. You see, it will probably look a bit different to Mary, but that's okay. Men will express it in different ways, but it's tragic. It is tragic when men pump the air and jump up and down and hug each other and cry with happiness at a football match, and then the next day they're in church and they've got their hands in their pockets. That's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. I long to see men on fire in worship, seeing Jesus for who he is. It might not look like Mary's worship, but it's got to be heart poured out. It's got to be. This has got to be a priority for us. We don't want to be cool off. We don't want to be cool in our worship of him. Men, let us pour our hearts out in worship to him. Let us model this. May we see wherever we proclaim Christ, wherever we plant churches, that men and women are pouring out their hearts in worship. We can sometimes think that's a bit too full on for visitors. Anyone find themselves thinking that sometimes? I know I've had that thought sometimes. Let's just get that out of our heads, shall we? People singing passionately, raising hands, jumping up and down, pumping the air. We sometimes think that's not very seeker sensitive. I, I am all for making people feel welcome. I'm all for explaining things. I'm all for preaching the gospel every week because we always have non-believers amongst us every single week. But let's not be cool in our worship. Let's not try and be cool in order to win people because these people will see people passionately pumping the air at a football match and think, well, this is not very exciting in comparison. They've got to see people poured out in worship. Our worship times are not the warm-up act for the preacher. We come to pour out our praise to him. It's an overspill of, of lives that are individually uh, enjoying him. So may it be that all over the world as we preach Christ, that we speak of his worth, that we see worshippers. God is seeking, God the Father is seeking worshippers. He's seeking worshippers, not people who are just kind of cool. He's seeking worshippers. May we be a family of churches that are alive in worship. May we repent and return to our first love. We have not got a lot of time. So, what we're going to do, friends, is we're going to just get before Jesus together. Um, we might have time for a song in a few minutes' time to, to close, but we're just going to get before Jesus. And just for a little while, it might be just silent in the room. Maybe you might want to just speak to him under your breath or out, out loud if you want to. Let's just repent of the times where we have had something else as our first love, Sometimes they're good things that just need to be kind of relegated to their rightful place. Let's tell Jesus we love him. You know, there's, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It, this is not a, not a moment to know condemnation. No, you are totally free of condemnation. But there's a moment for us, just at the beginning of these three days, just to say to him, Jesus, you are the priority. It's you that I love. It's you that I live for. Maybe I'll pray in a few minutes, but let's just right now where we are, might want to even get some space. Just tell him you love him. Pour your heart out to him. He is worthy of it. Let's enjoy him just for a few moments in silence and then we'll sing.